My legal name is David Anderson. Folks in this organization know me as Blue Hat Dave. Uh, I am a department head, which is a way of two departments, which is a long-winded way of saying I know how much fun I've had by how tired I am. Although I will say this organization is getting better about encouraging you to not do that to yourself, which I very much appreciate. Uh, I was born in Iowa, raised in Wisconsin. My dad worked for John Deere, the people who make the green tractors and the yellow road construction equipment. He was in the IT department. Um, and I never did figure out quite what he did, to be honest. Uh, I went to college in Minnesota at Gustavus Adolphus College because Minnesota is New Sweden, and that was the name of a Swedish king back in the 1630s. And then I got a PhD in physics at William and Mary because apparently my subconscious wants me to attend universities named after royalty. I, not consciously, I promise you on that. Uh, my specific field was high energy phenomenology. So if you've heard of the Large Hadron Collider, that's the experimentalists and they get bumps on graphs. And then you've heard about these crazy theorists with their chalkboards and their computers dealing with all kinds of matrices. Phenomenologists are the ones who go, okay, this term in this matrix is the same thing as this bump on the graph. So we basically translate between the two. Um, got that PhD in 2006 because I'm over 40 and starting to realize I might be turning old someday soon. Uh, spent three years at a small liberal arts college in Michigan teaching in the physics and math departments as a visiting replacement professor because they kept having people go on sabbatical. And then the Great Recession hit and I actually went back there for one last semester in 2013 but I have not been employed strictly as a physicist since then because the Great Recession was interesting that way. Uh, I did wind up driving a forklift for a while, I, for MAGFest actually, life is strange, uh, and then I got hired by a telecommunications company in Northern Virginia, so I do software for a living now, formal title is data scientist. In this case what that means is I take roaming agreements out of Excel spreadsheets and put them into databases. And I have discovered that there are many interesting ways to misspell the na country name Luxembourg. Um, that said, I also do tutoring on the side. So I do mostly high schoolers, but I do keep my hand in. And I do also currently live in Iowa, so I had a lot of fun shoveling during the snow apocalypse we had a week ago. Um, so that's my background. Uh, how many of you have degrees in physics? Okay. How many of those are PhDs? Okay. Um, if you're going to ask me about the paper somebody came out with last week, I'm going to say that sounds very interesting. Hopefully I'll be able to catch up with it in retirement. <laughs> Let me be completely honest. But uh, otherwise, this is literally, what questions do you have for a physicist? Anybody? Okay, let's start there. So, how much of video game physics works in applying to real physics? Say a game like Mario Brothers. Interesting question. So, the question, and I will forget to do this, but I'm going to try to repeat them into the microphone, is how much video game physics is, resembles real physics? And the answer is, it depends. In the example of Mario Brothers, not a whole lot. Um, but there are definitely engines that do a very good tr job trying to represent the real world. And one thing that I have downloaded off of Steam, although because I'm busy I haven't started it yet, is something called X-Plane, which is a labor of love by a guy who actually simulates airflow around airplanes. So I at some point hope to be like, okay, so this wing shape on that fuselage, will it fly? So you can find very good ones, and I believe a lot of the more recent first-person shooter just engines that you can then build an actual game on can be very good. Yes? So not specifically video game related, but do we have any reason to believe that faster than light travel is actually possible or practical to do? 
So the standard answer is no and no. Um, so there's this guy named Einstein, you've probably heard of him. He's the one who noticed that, uh, yeah, that seems to be a speed limit. If you are massless, you must travel at that speed, and if you have mass, you can never quite hit that, which is deeply unfortunate because it's going to make it awfully hard to visit our friends on Alpha Centauri if there is actually anybody living there. And that said, you can come up with some mathematical ways to build a wormhole or something. Uh, the trouble is they either tend to need very, very large amounts of energy, like more than our sun, or something, or negative amounts of energy, which is a statement that if you're a physicist is like, what? I don't, what does that mean? That is the opposite of a sensible thing, but so, Look, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I also like Star Wars. They serve very different purposes. They don't have to fight. Um, and I would love to go just visiting other places. Definitely not something I expect to see in my lifetime, although if somebody proves me wrong, I will be very happy to congratulate you on your Nobel Prize and then say, can I take a ride? <laughs> yes. What do you want to rapidly approach the speed of light? I'm saying, given that anything with mass can never travel faster than light, do you think that technology would ever allow us to approach the limit of that speed? So we do that at the Large Hadron Collider and other accelerators. Like, they get up to 0.0999. It's so like, how many nines do you have there with electrons, protons? Um, occasionally helium nuclei, and they have some, they like shooting lead around. I forget quite how fast that gets going, but it's still a couple of nines. So you can get an atom going very fast indeed. If you want to get yourself moving that fast, that's going to be much, much harder, simply because, well, it's called the Tevatron. It goes through tera-electron volts. Um, Large Hadron Collider. 14 tera electron volts. So you have a million, billion, trillion. I believe this is one more step up from that. Do I have that right? Person the, okay, one more step up from that. So, and now we're talking about a single atom, and now add up how many atoms there are in your body. Uh, yes. Probably in their basement. Uh, you, you, well, let's see. I just want to see how many zeros. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Times, uh, let me see. Let's just say 50 kilos. Times, um, oh, let me, and then we got Avogadro's number. And, oh, shoot. Fine, Wolfram Alpha. Ah, assuming I don't fat finger too much. All right. Well, there it is. Uh, let's see. So that is going to be 10 to the 26th. And if you want to, and if you want to get down to a normal number like joules, divide that by. Uh, 10 to the 19, which is still quite a bit of energy. <laughs> and that's assuming that you weigh about 110 pounds. Um, sort of adding on to that, is there a frame of reference, like how many suns of energy do you have? Oh, that? 
is an interesting question. Um, and I am going to do a thing. So yes, I'm at Wikipedia. It's fine because, look, this is not one of the controversial things. You've probably been told, especially if you're younger than I am, do not use Wikipedia as a source. It's a great place, you, well, you should have been. But it's a great place to find sources. Exactly. Um, so, let's see, do we have an energy? Any mean radiance? Okay, so. You're looking at about how much this, on the order of magnitude of how much the sun puts out in a second. To move one 110 pound person to near the speed of light. I'm sorry? Uh, so, ah, I am a physicist, so unless I have to, I assume there is no atmosphere and no friction. <laughs> so once you're up there, <laughs> so once you're up there, you're going to keep going until you hit something. Obviously, if you're in an atmosphere, you're going to hit a lot pretty quickly, especially if you're going that fast. Yes. Um, which actually brings up an interesting point. If any of you have uh, read Randall Monroe's What If, he has a lovely thing in there about, so a baseball at nearly the speed of light, and the fun thing is it's going fast enough that it causes all sorts of nuclear reactions with the atmosphere it hits, and you blow up your city in a mushroom cloud. It's a good book to read. Uh, yes. Fruitful in what sense? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. What makes everyday life better? Okay. Uh, the reason I ask that is because we don't know what 90, 95% of the universe is made out of which is very cool and interesting because we've still got a lot to learn. On the other hand, the answers to that are probably not going to change what we do on a daily basis a whole lot. Again, if you get, win your Nobel Prize for figuring out what that 95% of the universe is and it does change our daily life a lot, I'll be happy to congratulate you. Um, I strongly suspect it's going to have to do with materials. We've had this interesting revolution in information in the past 50 years, which had not really happened to humans before other than the printing press and writing. A lot of our innovations in the Industrial Revolution were we don't have to use human or animal muscle to do things. That's causing some other interesting problems right now, but, you know, we don't break our backs for a living, most of us, especially in this room. Um, on the other hand, that technology of information might actually allow us to do interesting thing with materials and energy generation, and I certainly hope it does, because we need that. In particular, I have in my mind, like, can we just, like, 3D print individual carbon atoms where we want them so we can just make a complete nanotube bridge or something? That'd be cool. I don't know if that's like necessarily the highest priority, but it does seem interesting. Um appropriately, I have not reviewed all sci fi <laughs> so shows, so I can't tell you. Um but this is going to be fun. Okay, let's see. So, we've got this lovely picture of a magnet. It's got two poles. Stuff comes out one side, stuff goes in the other side. This happens to be an electromagnet, but it works for a bar magnet, too. You flip it around. I'm going to wave my hands a lot because I'm a physicist and we do that. If anybody's vision impaired, I apologize. It's, it's what I am. Um, that would be reversing the polarity. Or in the particular case of an electromagnet, uh, you could actually reverse the direction the current's running through and it should still do the same, and it should also reverse that. 
Whether or not that would actually fix a problem in any useful way is a very different question, but it is a thing you can do in some cases. Uh, let's, I saw you, so. So the question was, barring safety, which is a good caveat, <laughs> uh, is the hoverboard from Back to the Future Part Two feasible? Um, I know I saw several years ago, they had some pro skateboarder doing something exactly like that. Now, they had him over a particular surface, so I don't think you could just go down the street with it, but there is something that exists. Um, actually, well, I have an internet connection. Let's look for this and hope rule 34 doesn't happen. Uh, not that one, not that, ah, yes. So. So they did in fact do a thing. No, I don't want TV, thank you. Okay, it's hovering. I, again, it's on a, this funky surface. Oh, this is from 2014. We're literally looking at almost a decade ago. Uh, but on the other hand, you will note you have not seen it in stores yet, so I assume there are challenges. Um, did I answer your question? Yes. Cool. You up front. Oh. I I am not and I will look it up afterwards. <laughs> the question was about a room temperature superconductor which would be quite the thing, but it's also apparently been debunked, which does not surprise me cuz that would be quite the thing and if it were true, I'm sure I would have heard about it. <laughs> I look forward to the paper being published and reading it. <laughs> um, plaid shirt. Uh, what do you realistically think will let humans to Mars? When do I realistically think we'll send a human to Mars? We could do that, like, like if we wanted to, we could do a moonshot type thing for that. It would be a lot harder simply because it's a lot further through the solar wind and radiation. But if we really just wanted to throw all of the money at that problem, we can do that now. But we don't have a Soviet Union to compete with right now, so we don't need to, which was unfortunately a lot of the thing behind the uh, Saturn Apollo space program. Just let's, again, Sputnik was huge in physics because that was the Soviet Union using a bunch of captured German rocket scientists and launching something around the wor world, uh, which literally was just a radio s repeating, I am here, but you know. But of course that made the relevant funding bodies, um, well, need to go home for a pants change and then say, okay, how much money do we need to throw into physics so that we can uh, compete with this in a decade well, 12 years after Sputnik, we were on the moon, which is pretty cool. They didn't manage it, uh, but they also collapsed. So the answer to that is probably when China starts making serious noises about it. Um, if Now, I'm a pie-in-the-sky idealist. I hope we could work with China to do that mutually, but looking at geopolitical situation, I don't see how that would happen. And as an aside, it's interesting watching physics employment because Sputnik happened and about a decade later, the second half of the 1960s, there were a whole bunch of physicists getting hired by colleges and universities all over the United States. I'm not as familiar with uh, higher education in other countries, so I don't know how things went there. 
And then they all retired in the 90s, so we had a new wave of physicists get hired. And they're probably starting to retire now, so if you want to get a job as a professor at a small liberal arts college in physics, I gotta say these bumps are going to be flattening out as t and broadening as time goes on, but this might not be a bad decade to do it. It might not be a good decade either, but you might have better luck than I did, let's put it that way. Uh, yes? So in Half-Life, they talk about a resonance cascade, and is there anything real like that? Yes, it's called a laser. <laughs> um, I'm not kidding. So the way lasers work is you get atoms into a metastable state, so there's an electron that's been excited out of its lowest possible energy state, but it hasn't become an ion and gone free. And the great thing about a laser is when one of those collapses and it shoots out a photon, it will induce others to shoot out photons exactly in phase. What is that? Ah, so waves, right? Uh, again, I'm waving my hands. So if I have a wave of a certain wavelength, they don't necessarily have to have started at the same point. So they could be out of phase, they could kind of be in phase, they could be exactly in phase. So if my wavelength is this long and one starts here and one starts here, they're going to cancel out. If they start at exactly the same point, they're going to add up, which is what happens in a laser. And that's why they can be very bright without particular power and they stay coherent, i.e. a tightly focused beam. Which is how we can measure how far away the moon is because they dropped some reflectors on it with the Apollo program. And we can just go and then wait for it to come back. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. I back there. Uh, I have a more inspiring question. Uh, okay. Do, do you like movies? And have you found that your your knowledge of physics ruins your enjoyment of those movies when unaware of physics? Very good questions. Um so the question was, do I like movies and does my knowledge of physics ruin movies? So I do like movies. Um, I will prefer a good book any day. Let me be honest on that. Uh, but I have a couple of friends who just enjoy streaming movies over Discord. Um, happened during the pandemic. They started doing that and you know I tend to show up and hang out. Um, as for whether or not that ruins movies, it depends heavily on how well or badly they do. So um, Wonder Woman 2, she's jumping around and I'm like, that's not how you move like that at all. Which is an interesting contrast with, you know, the Avengers where I'm like, okay, so we have an obviously CGI eight foot tall green thing, but if you were to jump around, that is how that would look. So I, which is kind of mind-boggling that one does it well and one does not. Um, other cases, it depends on what they're doing. If they do a decent job or at least don't do anything boneheadedly bad, I'm fine. Um, or, you know, if it's so bad it's just hilarious to laugh at that, that can also be okay. But yes, there is an annoying uncanny valley where it's like, you slept through high school physics, didn't you? <laughs> and chemistry and a few other things. Um, let's see. I've seen you for a bit. Um, well, I, wanted to ask, I wanted to come back to your discussion of okay. uh, physicists in the near future. And okay. Okay, so the question was, how do we get young people interested in the study of physics? And the answer is, I don't know. Cause, so my story on how I got into physics is my freshman year of high school, we have that like general science class, physical science class, sound familiar? 
And one day they showed, again, I'm old, so this was the early 90s, that PBS special, A Brief History of Time. And my possibly autistic, possibly not quite autistic brain went, well, that was a lot of stuff about that guy in the wheelchair, not nearly enough about that cool stuff he actually does. I told you. Um, and then I discovered that my local library, despite being in a town of less than 4,000, had a copy of A Brief History of Time, which was not about the guy in the wheelchair, it was by the guy in the wheelchair, Stephen Hawking. And so my, sometime my sophomore year, I read it, and I went, okay, so I only put in one equation, E equals MC squared, with a snarky remark about how if this has cut my sales by half, I'm okay with that. Um, and then he talks about a whole lot of cool stuff that I want to know how to actually do it, which means I need to learn the equations. So my junior year, I took physics, even though that was where I was at least. That was usually a senior year class. And that went really well. And then I just wrote it out until I got a PhD. Now, that said, I grew up in a town. Uh, my graduating class was exactly 100 from high school. Uh, exactly half of those were going on to any further education. And that includes things like cosmetology school. So your graduate school was going to cosmetology school where I grew up. Um, so I don't know about other tracks. I fell in love with it. It worked out well. Um, how do we encourage? Now that said, I did go to a good co undergraduate college for it. And if you are also from a small town like I am, uh, if you are any good at all at physics, when you get accepted to graduate school, you don't have to pay for it. That was a huge surprise to me because literally nobody in my family or town knew that. Again, the Sputnik thing, Congress gives the NSF money, National Science Foundation, and they help you pay for graduate school. Your, your advisor will get a grant, and part of that will include your salary and your tuition and all that stuff so you don't have to pay it directly. If you do get accepted to a graduate school in the natural sciences, history or something like that would be a completely different story. Yeah, those you have to pay for. But if you get accepted in the natural sciences and they want you to pay, that's their way of saying, we don't actually think you have a future, but we'll be happy to take your money. So, but uh, it's not that bad once you get there. That said, getting there, you have to have some talent a lot of persistence, and be willing to work hard. But that's kind of true if you want to succeed at anything unless your parents are billionaires. Um, and encouraging people. So I will say we, there are a lot of teaching physicists who are trying to make it more accessible to, people, to everybody because physics is story problems all day, all the time, which is a huge turnoff for a lot of people, and I get that. Um, there are people trying to figure out how to reach other brain types than the ones that we have been selecting for so far. So help them with that and, you know, take a chance on a physics class. Uh, yes. Oh dear, I have a couple of confessions. Um, <laughs> so the questions were what simulation things, especially flight simulators, are most accurate? And then what is my favorite Big Bang episode? Um, so let's see. I don't know on the first one because I don't actually have time to play them. To be completely honest, I do know X-Plane does that thing that I mentioned. Past that, I can't tell you much. Um, as for my favorite Big Bang episode, I've only ever seen two because when it first came out, I was a working teaching professor, so I would get done with grading at 9 p.m. and go home and crash in bed. And then there was the Great Recession, and my day job is applying for new jobs. So I, I regret to say that I can't give you recommendations on those. 
If you can recommend something for me, I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, let's see. I've seen you in the back with the hat for a while. <laughs> so those are two very different questions. Um, so the first question was, what happens when we read the, reach the limits of computer processing power? And I'll go into that in a bit. And then second, what the heck is quantum computing? Okay, so the first one, transistors. They involve semiconductors. You've heard of that, I assume. Okay, so that we do not know how to make a transistor without quantum mechanics. It's a really cool thing. Um, and the great thing is you can put a whole bunch of transistors on one chunk of silicon. The problem we run into is at some point you're making them so small that they're only a few atoms across and you're starting to run into quantum effects you don't want, like stuff jumping between different transistors. So that's why we're running into limits. Uh, so the bad news is, is that the doubling of computing power that we've been basically writing on for the past 50 years might come to a screeching halt, which if you've been, if you're depending on that is going to be bad. Although at the same time, I'm not sure my life has gotten better from increased computing power in the past 10 years. Up until then, yes, absolutely, I can, can see improvements. I'm not so sure it's doing much for me right now. Uh, Bitcoin mining, for example, doesn't do a whole lot for me. <laughs> um, as for quantum computing, so instead of a transistor to be, is it this or this kind of bit, although an actual bit involves several transistors to make sure it's stable, you get a very cold atom in a particular state and you get a few of them entangled with each other, which is why, you know, when you actually see these things in, well, a lab, they're usually surrounded by helium and then liquid nitrogen tanks. Um, and, the re and the thing is, you get a probabilistic outcome of these because it's quantum mechanics, it might be this or it might be this. So you're making a bid in a completely different way. The reason people care about quantum computing is that it might allow you to solve some uh, security problems much more easily because you can do different kinds of operations. You don't just have and and or. You can take square roots of those, whatever that means. But uh, People want to do this. There are some commercial like simulation things that I think you can buy now if you've got more money than I do, um, but which are room temperature. But again, they're kind of cheating. Uh, I probably didn't answer that as full as you want. Please feel free to see me after. Uh, let's see, you way there in the back. Do not say just a biology major. <laughs> but, um, I, anyway, I kind of realized too, I kind of get confused in like what like Charles, like my knowledge of it is like all through DeGrasse Tyson, but like even Neil DeGrasse Tyson is a good source. I was like listening to like a podcast, a very casual podcast, and they were talking about like, but anyway, they were talking like about entanglement, and a lot of the confusion I noticed that seems to be is, um, Okay, so the kind of the question is, I'm going to rephrase a bit, is what is entanglement actually? And that is an excellent question. So if you go to any university library, there will be 
a shelf of, you know, old school mechanics from before the 20th century. There'll be a couple shelves of general relativity. And then there will be like five stacks of quantum mechanics books because anytime anybody thinks they get it, they write a book about it. Which is, which is another way of saying nobody actually gets it. The usual way of, of the math works, okay? The math Heisenberg and Dirac and people came up with works. It will give you the answer you need every time. Why it works to make get it intuition, I don't think the human brain evolved to do that. The human brain evolved to throw rocks and probably other things at lions and tigers and bears trying to eat us. Um, so the math works and then all of the interpretations of it are trying to build an intuition around this thing which is fundamentally very weird because we weigh roughly 50 kilos, we're about two meters tall, well, usually a bit less, and so on and so forth, and we're talking about very, very tiny things that behave fundamentally differently. <laughs> that said, uh, I th my suspicion is that the best approach is probably something called pilot wave theory, if you really want to get into that. From what I've seen, uh, obviously you're going to comment on that, which, no, no, that's good. Um, but I haven't actually looked into that to judge it well yet. The usual one is Niels Bohr's interpretation, which is we make a measurement and it collapses. That's the shut up and trust the mathematics version way of describing quantum mechanics. We're just saying it more politely. So entanglement, that said, the way we usually think of it is, okay, we've got two things that we've managed to get entangled with each other. And then if we very carefully pull one far away from the other without looking at it or interfering with it, then once we do look at the other one, then we know what the other one has to be. The interesting thing is anytime you try to make a faster than light communication system with this, you find some little bug where, okay, yes, that happens and that happens, but you don't actually know that it's any good for you faster than the speed of light because you're still light speed limited on that. Did that help? Yeah, I just glad someone else was asking. Oh, yes. No, it, it's a very tough question. Um, your hand. Okay. Um, are you familiar with Gary Sam Green? I'm sorry, say that again. Gary Sam Green, the video game came out in 2012. I am not familiar. So, funny you mention that. So there's a video game, what was it called again? Sirius M3. Sirius M3, where apparently there is a collision between a planet and a moon and they both explode. So, one of my colleagues at the Albion College where I taught in Michigan was an astronomer who actually worked on the origin of the moon. And as near as we can tell, the way the moon originated is something smacked into the Earth and blasted enough off of it that it formed our moon, because our moon is weird because it's really big relative to us, unlike most moons relative to their planets. Um, so what happens is you don't get planets exploding. They just kind of mush and, you know, if there's anything living there, you're going to have enough volcanic activity, you're not going to have anything living there. But they're not going to do like an Alderaan bluey that away. <laughs> Um, yes. Congratulations and good luck. <laughs> uh, pretty much. So, okay, so you are a senior undergrad right now? Okay, so if they're interviewing you, you're probably in pretty good shape. Just remember that. Um, yes, breathe. Were you the guy who helped me with this a couple years ago? No? no? OK. I actually had another physicist come up here and start helping me answer questions a couple years ago. Um, um, <clears throat> let's see. 
what kind of PhD program are you applying for? Just straight physics, you don't know exactly what you want to do yet, or? Okay. You've been studying this, you know your stuff. Like, if you, whatever nervousness you have, have your uh, ego and superego be like, no nervousness, we got this. I'm going to punch you in the face until you stop being bad. <laughs> um, like, just do that. And, you know, if it's like three old white men interviewing you, well, Thank you for being the generation that'll correct that. <laughs> um, let's see, blue mask, please. Uh, what's the coolest, in your opinion, piece of sci-fi technology that's actually feasible to build? Oh, that's an interesting question. What is the coolest piece of sci-fi technology that would actually be possible to build, in my opinion? I mean, we already have 3D printers, which are pretty cool. <laughs> um, uh, let me, hmm. Honestly, I, I would really like to see a fusion-powered starship that could like get me to another planet, and in the same process as creating enough of a magnetic field around it that I don't have to deal with the radiation. Again, we're talking a stupid amount of money, but this is, as near as I can tell, in the realm of, like, we don't have to invent new physics or find a piece of magic somewhere. Um, there was this television show in the early 2000s starring Kevin Sorbo, Andromeda, which did not turn out well, in my opinion, but uh, they did have an honest-to-goodness physicist giving them science advice. Uh, he quit by the second season and left quite the burn letter on his website because reasons, but you know, um, giving them advice. So aside from the two pieces of magic tech of we can manipulate mass, well, inertia without doing anything else, and of course we have a faster-than-light thing because sci-fi show, other than that, it was actually very good on not doing anything that we couldn't conceivably do. Like, everything's made out of carbon tied together in certain ways. Stuff's just accelerated because of lots of energy. And we can manipulate mass, so make it tiny masses. Um, that kind of thing. Um, yes? Do we want to mine other planets, basically? Um, there are lots of resources. The question is, how do you make the transportation worth it? Because right now we use rockets, and rockets are a stupidly expensive way of getting anywhere. Like, just literally, I do mean stupidly expensive way of getting anywhere. If we, like decide to colonize the asteroid belt so we're just already out there, then it's a slightly different story. But at that point, we have a whole different set of problems. Yes? Yes, they do that in Switzerland, and it works very well for them. <laughs> Okay, we have an excellent storage system. It's called um, bacteria grow from about three billion years ago in the ocean to about 500 million years ago, die, fall on the floor, stuff, other stuff falls on them, and geologic forces convert them into oil. Chemical reactions, especially combustion or just general oxidation, are a great way to store energy. The trouble is, 
we've been relying on stuff that happened and releasing stuff back into the atmosphere that hasn't been there for a billion years. Um, and we need to start doing this in a cyclical way and we're going to basically stop robbing the Earth's piggy bank that it built up. Uh, as for pushing water up a hill and then letting it flow back down, uh, keep it simple stupid is... <laughs> you, it's hard to go wrong with that one. Uh, somebody was asking about interesting technology. If you can figure out how to, you know, genetically engineer a tree that just grows up and squirts out oil, Again, I will congratulate you on your Nobel Prize and thank you for just directly turning sunlight into something that I can put in my car, make the exhaust smell like french fries. <laughs> Which biodiesel, I guess, kind of does sometimes. Yes? Yes, but I have a day job and then a side job, so I don't get to look at them much. Uh, the question is, are there any interesting fields that I'm particularly excited about? Uh, I was very sad when the Large Hadron Collider on July 4th, 2012, announced the discovery of the Higgs, because that's what I'd worked on, and the stream was dead. At least where I was. Yes, oh yes, it was, oh yeah. So it was like, okay, I got this, I tested it yesterday, <laughs> um, but uh, I will say, if you really want to keep up with things, there is this lovely thing, which I routinely look at astrophysics, phenomenology, and high energy experiment. So this is the preprint archive. It is not peer reviewed. But often what you do if you're going to get something peer reviewed is you go here and then if you don't get any what my advisor called nasty grams, hey, why didn't you cite my thing? It's obviously related, which sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. Um, then you actually just tell whichever peer reviewed journal that you're trying to get it into, hey, here's the link. And then they look here. Uh, this is a nonprofit. It's currently run by Cornell University or supported by Cornell University. I'm not sure exactly what the relationship is. Uh, but I mentioned I'm old. The uh, website I first knew it as was uh, because this predated the World Wide Web. That is xxx.lanl, Los Alamos National Lab.gov. So there was, at least at one point, a web address that had triple X and .gov in it. <laughs> I am not kidding. It was, and of course they don't have it there anymore, but that was the original site for what is now ARXIV. Um, which is kind of a shame because they did keep it as a mirror for quite a while. Um, so there are ways to keep up with things, uh, and you will notice that this has not just physics, although you can tell that that's how it got started, because let's look at what's at the top and the way we go. There's even economics on there. Um, you in the MAGFest hoodie who's been raising your hand. Uh, what's your favorite sci-fi book series? Sci-fi book series? Yeah. Ooh. Um, hmm. I might go with Timothy Zahn's original, well, his first trilogy for the Star Wars universe, where he introduced Thrawn. <laughs> now, even then, uh, I will say, by the third book, he's displaying his tendency to make people impossibly genius as opposed to very genius, but it's still a lot of fun. Uh, if you want hard sci-fi, hmm. <sighs> Give me a minute to think and ask me again after, <laughs> please. Um, let's see, you back there far on the right. Yes, you, who's looking around, yeah. Okay.
So to run up the side of a building like happens in some video games, uh, you would basically need to have very high friction shoes so you don't slip back. I mean, that's all a squirrel does going up a tree. It just has claws so that it can stick into the bark. But that said, of course, that gets a lot more challenging if you're, you know, human-sized than, like, how much does a squirrel weigh? A pound? I don't know. Something like that? Um, I think you've had your hand raised a few times. No? Okay. I, I, I just have a, a quick and dirty one. Okay. The question is, do gravitons exist? And the answer is, I don't think we've discovered any yet, so I'm going to say I don't know. <laughs> um, that said, for those of you who are not as into this as you clearly are, um, we do have a gravitational wave detector, and it, how they do it is very cool because they have lasers shooting through, what is it, four kilometers on a side, I think? Oh at, and they've got two, so it's an L, so they can see the difference. And they've got one in Washington State and one down in Louisiana. And you have to have that because otherwise a truck driving by in Montana would completely swamp what they're seeing from a neutron star merger where, you know, neutron stars weigh more than our sun and there's two of them colliding. So it's very cool, look at, a, I believe it, is it called least, no, LIGOS, LIGOS, L-I-G-O-S. Um, let's see, way in the back. Uh, I guess, two things, adding on the first one, there's a really good book on LIGOS, like number 11, I don't know. Oh, okay. But um, uh, pulling back a little bit, when we were talking about quantum mechanics, you had mentioned that there's a debate between <laughs> yes, that's why we still are doing science. Um, so the question is, are there still parts of science that conflict? The biggest one from my perspective is something called dark energy, which um, is interesting because Einstein got it wrong like three times in a row. Because when he first came up with uh, general relativity, he's like, oh, the universe is either expanding or collapsing, but we know that's not true. So let me put this term in to make sure that it just holds steady, which he called lambda, so you'll hear it called that. And dark energy works the same way as lambda, so they are the same thing in a sense. And then Hubble, or really his helpers and graduate students, noticed that uh, the universe was in fact expanding, so he's like, oh, let's get rid of that. But you're not supposed to just get rid of a term that makes sense because, well, you don't see it. You can just say that the constant in front of it is very small, or possibly zero. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is if you work through the quantum mechanics on how much big on how strong dark energy should be, um, you would never hear what I'm saying because you're too far away and the universe would be expanding too fast. Experimental, let, let's run this experiment. Obviously, that's not happening. <laughs> and we don't quite know why. <laughs> so that's fun to think about. Um, and I would like to correct your question a little bit, if I may. The math works. It's Niels Bohr interpretation, attempted intuition that's like, just shut up and trust it if we're actually honest about what that means. There are others, again, feel free to wander into your local university if you have one within like 50 miles of you and just start looking at the stacks of quantum mechanics books. Uh, I believe you had a question. Yes. So, uh, first off, is that your computer on the projector? Yes. So, um, uh, <laughs> actually, for my day job, I use Mac OS, and I'm starting to hate it with an almighty passion, <laughs> but um, that, I don't know if that's Mac OS or what, you know, my IT department has on it to lock things down, but anyway, um, we use Linux, 
like for the thing that I put my grade spreadsheet on, maybe not. But if I'm doing an experiment, I'm using Linux because it's easy and I don't have to worry about it breaking. And if it does break, I know how to fix it by the time I've set it up. And again, in science, you want it to be able to crunch some numbers or run your script or keep your whatever process alive. You don't need any of the fancy UI or anything that you've got for uh, Windows or Mac OS, although they are kind of nice when you need to put the press release out. But you know, you can copy and you can put something on a thumb drive, put it on your other computer for that part. Um, and if you're wondering, this browser I'm using is something called Vivaldi. So if you're old like me and remember a browser called Opera, which is still technically around, that was the first one to come up with tabs on a browser. Uh, the, the guy who owned it, sold it, went, oh, I don't like what you're doing with that, so I'm going to start a new browser. And this is what I use now. It's another reskin of Chrome, so if you hate Google, you're not going to like this. But uh, the good news is um, you can actually stack tabs. So like, let me just, let's not do that. Oh, there, I just did it. So I have a stack of tabs. And where did I hide that from? Oh, yes. So I've got two of them right here so you can keep things organized. And they also have something called workspaces, which you can do stuff with to declutter your entirely too many tabs that are open. Um, it's very stable, and it does use the Chrome store if that's what you're, if you're looking for add-ons. And then I saw a question way in the back. Yes. So the question is, is bunny hopping in first-person shooter games good or bad? Uh, I'm honestly not quite sure because the only first-person shooter I was ever any good at was when we were doing multiplayer um, Halo. And only on the map where I got to set it up as the smallest map in nothing but rocket launchers. <laughs> Which is just s spam rockets, jump around, and occasionally club people. And everybody dies <laughs> and swears at you and never lets you do that again. Yes? Do you have any opinions on UAVs? Uh, do I have any opinions on UAVs? You ate. An aerial phenomenon. Oh, um, unidentified aerial phenomenon, what I grew up calling UFOs. Okay. Um, are there little green men out somewhere else out there in the universe? Almost certainly it's a big universe. Are we ever going to see them? I would be very surprised. It's a very big universe. Have they come here? Not that I know of. Um, I'm pretty sure that most, if not all of that, is either just something that happens rarely enough that we don't get a good chance to measure it and describe it scientifically, or, you know, it was an SR-71 going by you and you didn't get a look at the tail number because it went by you at Mach 3.2 because that's what SR-71s do, or whatever hypersonic thing they've got now. Yes. Um, Although that said, I do have a friend who was talking to some Lockheed people and went, so you have an alien spaceship? We can neither confirm nor deny. Okay, uh, how about the brown note thing? Oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, so you do have an alien spaceship. <laughs> I, you know, any other questions? Okay, Taylor. Yes. Uh, I did mention, so basically the Marvel's universe, within the limitations that it's, you know, the Marvel extended universe, does a surprisingly good job of, okay, if we had a, you know, eight foot tall CGI thing, it would move like that. Um, let me see. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, although physics wasn't really the emphasis there. Any of the recent... 
Again, I had a very interesting time during the Great Recession, so if you're asking me about a movie that happened since then, I'm kind of like, I probably haven't watched that. <laughs> um, I've heard good things about, I believe, the 2014 Gravity, but I could be mis... So it's on my to-watch list. Um, let's see. I do not have something right off the top of my head. And I'm seeing the wrap it up, so those of you who want, still have, want to raise your hands, please see me in the hall if that doesn't block things up too much. Thank you. All right.